Hello everyone, my name is Carlos Morales. I work at Ambic as a head of AI. And today I will be speaking about uh, the future of intelligent IoT endpoints. And specifically, uh, some of the memory implications that our design has for AI and some of the implications AI has for our, our SOC design. Uh, but first, uh, let me talk about today's topics. For, I want to spend some time uh, uh, covering what Apollo 4 is. It's our flagship product, the, the Apollo 4 Plus. And specifically of interest to this presentation is the fact that it has two megabytes of uh, MRAM. MRAM is magneto-resistive magneto RAM. Say that three times in a row. Um, which is a uh, type of non-volatile uh, memory that is very efficient, uh, especially from a power perspective. Uh, we'll spend a little bit about a uh, little bit of time talking about why AI is actually relevant in this space and why it's practical. And then I'll uh, quickly go over an experiment I did comparing MRAM with TCM, which is a type of uh, SOC memory and also shared SRAM. Okay, so just a word about your sponsor. Uh, Ambic is a uh, provider of hyper, hyper, ultra low power uh, uh, SOCs. Uh, we leverage something called sub-threshold uh, design into something we call sub-threshold power optimized technology uh, in order to reduce our power many times over uh, equivalent designs, not using spot. Um, and when we say many times, we, you know, lawyers like to say multifold, let's not get specific, but I've measured anything between 5x and 16x better uh, efficiency. And that's not 5 to 15% better, that's five times better at the bottom and 16 times better at, at the top in terms of efficiency. And that's a game changer. When you can use, you know, one fifteenth the power, uh, it means you can do more with your product. You can do more compute, you can do more uh, algorithmic uh, things like AI, or you can just make it last longer. Um, our products are SOCs that are designed to be the brains of a lot of different, very far edge battery powered applications. Uh, anywhere where power is important, uh, you can find an application for a part. And, uh, uh, you know, from my point of view, I'm just a AI knucklehead. What I see is just a new way of enabling AI at the edge without the traditional uh, uh, balancing act that you have to do between doing like computationally intense uh, algorithms versus, you you know, sucking down the battery. So here we have, you know, I can do both. I, yeah, I have liberty to do both. I should not do, not sucking down the battery. You can do real AI without sacrificing battery. Okay, a uh, very quick diagram of what's included in our SOC. As you can see, it's built around a Cortex-M4. Um, it has two modes. Uh, hyper-efficient mode, which is a 96 megahertz, and then just efficient mode, which is uh, 192. And uh, how, which one you pick for AI is actually pretty interesting. Um, it's not as straightforward as uh, always using 96. Sometimes some of this computation is more efficient if you do it faster. And sometimes because of latency requirements, you have to do it faster. Um, in terms of memory, which is of interest to this group, um, we have a a large iCache. We have a pretty large TCM, 384K. Um, and then most interesting to this uh, discussion is we have a big pile of NRAM, uh, NVM uh, memory. And if uh, anyone in the audience is uh, familiar with trying to do AI at the, at the endpoint, you know that you're always struggling with uh, uh, model sizes and trying to get them into the you know, the 512K or sometimes megabyte of a NVM that you have. And usually that NVM is not super performant. In our case, I have a luxurious two megabytes. Um, I, I laugh because my last world, uh, life started at 32 gigabytes. And um, 
went rapidly up from there. So this is a, this is a different experience for me. Um, compute and memory are not the only important things. Uh, this is an endpoint device, so it's meant to do everything. Right? There's no peripherals, there, or it's designed to be uh, standalone. Uh, you don't necessarily need peripherals. You have to uh, have really good low power I.O. You have to have, uh, because a lot of our applications are audio, we've designed in low power audio, ADCs and so on. And actually I take a, a full advantage of that uh, when we use AI uh, audio tasks on our devices. Um, and then sometimes you want to, you know, show off what you just computed. So we have a, a sophisticated 2.5D GPU uh, built into our device as well. It's meant for things like uh, small uh, displays, 500 by 500. That's your typical uh, watch display. Okay, so enough about us. Let's talk about AI because, again, um, I'm kind of a one track mind on this one. Endpoint AI is uh, kind of a novel uh, uh, space market in the field. And I'll define it. And, and talk about why it's important. Okay, so uh, before I do that, I want to talk about uh, how practical and real this thing is. This is not some uh, pie in the sky, you know, uh, theory. This is real. Um, and and really, this market is as we sit here currently exploding. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, uh, this, this one is always draws a few chuckles. People often do not use easy and AI in the same sentence. But trust me, AI is the easiest way to do hard things. And I'll cover that in a bit. Um, endpoint AI is exploding for a reason. It's There are three major kind of trends that are converging. And uh, we'll cover those. And then uh, it's important to understand that uh, the AI part, the part where you're doing the compute, is only a small part of the entire end-to-end -end operation. You have to do things from sensing all the way to actuation. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And and really the, the takeaway is that AI is practical today. It's not something that um, I'm, you, I'm writing a white paper about or anything like that. It's on every wrist. You may or may not and, you know, if you have a smartwatch or a fitness band, it's running AI today, and it's that's not hype. It's actually how uh, it does all those magical things it does. Okay, so let's let's get into this. Um, I promised a definition of what I meant by endpoint AI and and why it's important. Right on on the left here, you see uh, the traditional way that our wristwatches do a lot of the AI today. When you talk to a wristwatch. You ask Siri or Alexa to do a thing. Um, it captures that voice. The wrist watch or the, the endpoint device doesn't have a lot of compute. So it does, it captures the audio, maybe does a little pre-processing, Bluetooth it over to a iPhone or some other edge device. And that may send it to the cloud for real, like more computation intense processing. And then it comes all the way back down. And that has uh, serious connotations in terms of response time. Um, I'm used to waiting two to five seconds for Siri to start a timer. So I, you have to subtract five seconds from any timer that you set. Uh, also, from, from the watch's point of view, transmitting that uh, uh, data costs uh, joules, right? So if you're obsessed uh, with power like Ambika's, every microjoule counts. So getting rid of that transmit where possible, super good. Endpoint AI does everything at the endpoint. So it eliminates that round two. You do all as much processing as you can locally. There's some things and I'll show them that you still can't. It's coming, but you still can't. Um, the response time is instantaneous. It's very, uh, it feels natural because it's happening right on your wrist and you're not transmitting. So the the instead of transmitting, you're computing, and the compute is much more uh, efficient than the transmit. Okay, so uh, uh, points to anyone in the room who uh, knows what Tanstaple is. If this makes it to YouTube, comments. I love to see these guys who like comments. No one ever comments. 
10 step up. What does that mean? Okay, so it is exploding. Uh, people like to use the word Cambrian explosion, but if you are in the tiny ML and the endpoint AI space, it's bewildering how much innovation is happening in this space. I mean, I'm easily bewildered, uh, but um, it really is really impressive. And, you know, part of that is the power advances that we're seeing. Part of that is what I generally call like uh, material advances, which is better sensors, uh, better batteries, and so on. There's all this physics that's happening at the endpoint that's enabling this stuff. There's computational advances such as what uh, Ambic brings, you know, cycle per watt. Um, and then there's algorithmic advance, uh, advances like uh, artificial intelligence, or really sophisticated algorithms fitting into very tiny spaces. All that comes together and it produces small, small smart, ubiquitous, and valuable uh, products. Um, one conference I went to recently, they were talking about disappearables, things that are so small and so ubiquitous that they just kind of fade into the background. And yeah, that stuck. I, really, that's what we're enabling. And why? I mean, well, we, we want to make money, but the way that industrial providers like yourselves and us uh, make money is by bringing joy to our end users. It has to make something better. And having a small watch that actually does real things accurately and, and uh, efficiently, it just brings joy. And talking about money, um, this is not a small market. Uh, IoT endpoints are predicted by McKinsey to hit between five and 12 trillion. You know, uh, I love analysts as much as the next person, but um, say they're wrong, right? Say they're, it's only two trillion. It's still crazy, right? This is a massive market and it spans everything from smart watches and bands, which is really our kind of main market, but also everywhere you look, there's a little bit of AI. There's it's almost, a, it's almost a, a joke at this point. I saw a toothbrush, one of these electronic toothbrushes that said AI enabled. And I'm sure what it is, is some kind of anomaly detector or some like you're brushing too hard thing, but it is probably using machine learning techniques to, to alert the user to something. Uh, it's everywhere, smart home office, your game controllers have a little bit of AI in there. Uh, factory automation that's exploding, um, just sensing things in the factory without having to retrofit anything or as many things, preventive maintenance and so on. It's a massive market. Um, before we jump in, this, this is a slide that's the Carlosian, Carlos, me, the Carlosian philosophy, which is AI is not the end. AI is a means to an end, right? Um, we've been doing kind of fuzzy logic for, for decades now. And fuzzy logic gets you something like a step counter. You can look at an accelerometer and kind of count steps. And it's, it, it's some days it's 9,000, some days it's 12,000, depending on, on you know, your gait and were you sneezing on the way. It's not very accurate. When you add AI, no longer, no, no, not only does the, accurate, the, the step counting get much more accurate, you can start looking for more signals in, in that waveform, the accelerometer and gyroscope waveforms, you can start distinguishing between cycle, you know, are you cycling? Are you stationary cycling? Uh, elliptical tracker. So hundreds of like little nuances uh, that a programmer would be like hard put to, to hand code, um, just kind of jump out to AI data driven coding. Um, likewise, um, you know, this is not an endpoint application, except you know, TVs are, are becoming endpoint. Um, when you you up-res from say one, you know, HD to 8K, you have to do some math. You have to interpolate those missing pixels. And if you do it the naive way, which is a sophisticated way, you're still doing something called bicubic interpolation. You get something that's useful. It, it still looks fuzzy. What AI does is actually uh, using SR GANs, uh, generative models, um, it says these two pixels look like a line. Okay, I'm going to draw a high resolution line between the two. And it works surprisingly well. Now, doing that real time for generic audio is something like a 10,000 watt 
operation. So it's not practical yet to put on a desktop TV or a 960 inch room. Uh, but that's coming rapidly down the pike. And why do we do these things? Why does cycling versus elliptical versus I'm, I'm swimming uh, matter? It's because these things bring joy. Like, like your end user will get a lot more value uh, from something that says, it looks like you're having a power walk. Would you like to record it? Versus, hey, I counted 9,000 steps. Likewise, this is also bringing joy to your end users and they will pay more and then you will make more. Okay, no one ever said I wasn't capitalist. Uh, let's jump to, uh, to uh, AI as an easy button. Uh, and I love this graph. So what you have to understand about this graph, which is tracking the accuracy of object classification over several years, is that before 2010, where, where this graph starts, data scientists have been working on object classification for decades, literally since you could get a picture into a computer, someone's been working on making that computer figure out what's in that picture. And a lot of us uh, have seen the progress. And for decades, after decades of dedicated research, the best they could do is about 25%. Um, in 2012, a famous uh, paper comes out. Um, AlexNet was really the, the big, like first superstar in, in the AI space. And immediately, error rate goes down to 15%. And the next, next year, still kind of catching on, another 3%. Keep in mind, that kind of progress would have taken another decade to using traditional methods. And, and I, I cut the, you know, right around 2015, we started beating people and using AI in terms of uh, object classification. And 2017, it's not that I'm lazy and I didn't want to look up the latest data. This challenge stopped because it was considered solved. Now, ob object classification has gotten even more sophisticated since then, but this particular challenge stopped. And what, what makes it easy, right? Traditionally, you know, if you're trying to identify a cat, somebody has to sit down and say, what makes a cat a cat and not a dog? And maybe there's, you know, eye shape or, or ear shape, but there's so many different kinds of cats and dogs. And, and so you're piling rules on top of rules and just handcrafting these things. Whereas in AI, you don't do that. In AI is what we call data-driven programming. It's just, uh, you just, you, you set up a, a, a set of rules, simple rules, relatively simple rules what you might call the, the AI model architecture. And then you feed it data, a lot of data. You see, feed it pictures of cats and dogs and mice and every variation of a cat. And you take a picture of a cat and you smush it and you kind of distort it. And you do that millions of times. And when it gets it right and says, that's a cat, you give it a reward. And when, you, when it gets it wrong, you kind of slap it. And over the course of a, several hours of training or days and or sometimes weeks of training, uh, if it figures out what makes a cat a cat and a dog a dog, no one told it explicitly. Uh, stochastically, statistically, it gets figured out. And that's a super, for, for things that work with a fuzzy world that we live in, that is a super powerful way of programming. And then we're, we're starting the next step in that, where we're using AI to create those models, right? Most of models today are handcrafted by data scientists. Um, and what we don't want that. What we really want is that the AI model for running is developed by a runologist, somebody who studied, you know, running and has multiple PhDs in, in gait analysis and, and so on. Not a data scientist who has to read a bunch of papers and be kind of a uh, hack at running, right? So, so there are tools that are coming online and they've been around for a while now, uh, where you, f you feed it data and the tool will figure out the best architecture for that. So those are cool. All of this is coming together to make like things that were literally kind of impossible, trivial for even high school students to do in some cases. All right. Three trends are actually pulling that AI power down to the endpoint. Um, the most exciting one, I think, because I'm a nerd, is that researchers are turning 
uh, their attention from the very big um, to the small, to the practical small things. And, and for years, I've been in AI for, for the better part of a decade now, uh, bigger was sexier. Like you could brag about how many billions or trillions of parameters your model had, how many megawatts of power you had to use to train it. Uh, that got you a paper, you got to speak at Neurops and so on. Um, but there is more and more interest in actually taking these uh, models in the opposite direction. Smaller is sexier, smaller is practical, smaller has more impact on the way that we live. And so I'm seeing uh, in papers come out that have really excellent progress in terms of uh, algorithmic improvements, how you design models, how you design models for designing models, but also quantization, compression techniques, sparsity, distillation, and so on. That's one big uh, tailwind that we're seeing. Another big one is that since the the software is actually maturing to the point where it's stable and you're not having to figure everything out yourself, there's a huge ecosystem popping up here. So I, I kind of joke that a high school student uh, could write an AI model today. And I actually saw a grade, like a sixth grade student doing uh, a knowledge detection for, for their science project. So this ecosystem is exploding. And then of course, the venture capital world likes to see exploding things and invest in them. So we're seeing a lot of tool chains pop up, a lot of uh, communities pop up that are just kind of feeding each other. And when you see that, you start seeing exponential growth. And then finally, technology, especially computational technology, is, is getting to the point where this is practical. It does you no good to have sophisticated AI and run out of battery in a day, which Apple Watch, I'm looking at you, it's doing more than AI. I'm not going to blame AI for, for that one. But what we need is practical. Like you're, you're, if you have AI in your clothes, it has to last weeks. You're not going to recharge your clothes every night. You, you know, your shoes, same thing. And I'm, I'm not kidding there. I've seen shoes and shirts with AI built in. So, so technology like Ambix is actually making this stuff uh, commercially and uh, kind of user friendly wise uh, uh, viable and practical. Okay, let's, let's jump to, to expand the picture and beyond just AI. I, I like to talk about AI. And AI is that little box in the middle that says inference. But you know, an endpoint is kind of living on its own. It's, it's off the grid, you know, so to speak. So it has to do the sensing, like reading sensors, as a process, the data from the, that raw data in, into something that inference can work on. And then, you know, it has to do something with uh, the results from that inference. And this is just one pipe, but like we usually have two or three AI models working in conjunction. So getting all that to work within a, like a tight, uh, uh, power budget, about a milliwatt, or, or if you want to be more practical, maybe two or three mill milliwatts if you're doing uh, multiple uh, AI models working together. That's what the goal is. And that's where we are right now. I, I can do uh, like real work uh, and stay within, you know, uh, about a milliwatt. Okay. Now getting a little bit to memory. Um, AI has two requirements, and we'll get a little bit further into this soon uh, in the next slides. Uh, but, you know, computation is a, a big part of it. So here the vertical is how many, uh, how much computation per inference you have to do. But also, the more computation you do, usually the bigger your model is. So memory is a huge part of the constraints in this space. Um, and so here I'm plotting out kind of different types of speech interfaces, AI enabled speech interfaces, some of which are familiar, such as keyword spotting. Everybody knows how to talk to Alexa or Siri or uh, Galaxy or whatever the, the you know keyword of the day is. Um, those are very simple models. Those fit in most SOCs. They do use power. So you have to be worried about running those continuously unless you have a 16x power advantage. Um, and they, they fit easily, like in 40K of RAM. So I know 40K for some applications is pretty big, um, but most SOCs can accommodate that. 
Speech to intent is kind of an elaboration of that. It's one of the coolest models I've ever seen. It, it, uh, so the idea is that human beings, regardless of language or cadence or anything, when we express an intent, it kind of sounds the same. Like turn on kitchen lights, turn the kitchen lights on, but in the la luce in la cocina, all those things have some cadence, some something magical. Right? AI is, is finding it, and so so it's possible to extract intent uh, from phrases without the AI understanding the words at all. It doesn't. So this model doesn't know what a kitchen is, or that you set light, or anything like that. It just kind of uh, it's like your dog. Like when when you say, "Hey, let's go play," your dog's ear ears go up. That uh, that doesn't matter if you change. It, it doesn't change. They, their ears will still go up if you say something different. Like, let's get your toy. Where's your toy? Let's go outside. Dogs, uh, they know the intent is playtime is coming. So it's very similar to that. And the way that it does it is really cool too. It t actually turns the audio into a picture and does a uh, uh, image classification on the spectrogram. So uh, it's one of my favorite models. Speech enhancement is a super uh, sexy uh, 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 AI task. I'm using it right now. It's like it's trying to cancel all the noise in my room as I record this. When whenever you teleconference, there is an AI model that's getting rid of the background noise. That's why Zoom and, and Team uh, conferences have gotten better. Uh, the, the, the challenge is to do it in a constrained environment. And we have that running. And it's actually quite impressive, uh, but it does, it's a its a pretty computationally intense model. You're going to run out of battery quickly unless you have a, a power advantage. And the model is getting bigger. Uh, but we can easily fit it on Apollo 4. Where it gets really hard is uh, anything that requires a language model. Language model means the, the AI actually kind of knows something about the language. It knows what words should go before or after a word. So that, and the reason you do that is because just recognizing words as phonemes and turning them into what you think is a, the right letter is reasonably accurate, but there's a lot of words that sound like other words. And, and so it's frustrating uh, for, if you're, if you're taking dictation, to have to go through that note that you just dictated and fix all the, the errors. By adding a language model, those errors, uh, the, the language model can correct those errors. It's like, no, no, usually those two words don't go together. These two other words that are similar do go to one, and it'll fix it for you. And that's that's why you can actually talk to your your phones and, and it actually works, as opposed to like 10 years ago when you're trying to dictate to, to your uh, PC and it was just an exercise in frustration. Those are harder because they, they, they use a lot more memory. Computation-wise, I think we, get, we have a lot. We know how to get that much compute. Um, it's just a, it's a matter of getting those models compressed. And remember that research tailwind, that they're focusing a lot of energy on getting that uh, compressed. So you bring all that together, and you start seeing some killer applications, right? Um, first, having a good endpoint uh, user interface is hard. Screens are very small. My fingers are big. The so so speech and gesture uh, user interfaces are going to be very important in the space. Um, and and so you need these are fuzzy things, right? You you need AI to enable those. Um, activity recognition. We briefly talked about that running versus cycling. So that's important, and having it accurate is important. Nothing turns a user off like uh, congratulating them for a uh, elliptical when they're actually on a, on a mountain bike. Um, but the next click up is actually the, the super killer app, which is adding context detection. turns out that knowing whether you're cooking or sitting down and, and just talking to your friends from a gesture point of view, like how your watch is moving around, it's very similar. So discriminating between those two is hard, but it's important because uh, depending on context, you might uh, your your watch may want to do one thing versus another. It's you know it's silly when it 
you know, a watch tells me to meditate when I'm driving, for example, which has happened, or tells me to go for a walk when I'm in a, an airplane or when I'm cooking. So um, adding context will just make that user's experience that much more joyful. Um, and then when you start mixing all these things together, uh, like changing your speech UI, because you know, when you're in a group and you want to talk to your watch, OK watch is necessary, because otherwise, how will it know you're talking to the watch and not to something else? But when you're alone, when you're doing a workout or something, that's just extraneous. It's, it's kind of silly. So, you know, start counting my reps if you're if you're sitting alone in, in a gym is more natural. And the the end goal is to make your devices kind of like smart attendants, like it, like t speaking to them and interacting with them as you would with another human. Uh, that's just kind of happens to sit on your wrist and be blind, except for like a accelerometer. It's tough, but I think it's it's definitely doable. So I'll briefly go over how AI uses memory, and then I'll go into the, the experiment. So here is a kind of a cartoon diagram of an AI model. You may have seen something like this before. I've arranged it so that the verticals are layers, and each layer is connected to the next layer via a set of synapses, if you like. Um, and again, this is a cartoon example. This is not, this is exactly not how it is. But what I've tried to illustrate here is that after you've trained the model, every one of these connections has a weight. And uh, that's what captures the learning and deep learning. And, and so those weights, after you've trained it, don't change uh, anymore. And so that has implications for memory, right? Uh, those weights can be stored in, you can store them in read, right? Of course but you could also store them in read-only memory. Um, but there's something else called an activation, which is given an input, you have to compute uh, the inference, uh, the, the prediction for that input. And uh, that is dynamic. So that always has to go in RAM, read-write memory. And, and so uh, here's an activation. Here's, here's uh, my dog, Lucy. You, you feed a picture of it. I expect it to recognize the dog. And most of the time, it does do all the computation. It flows the data through. It, and, and she does look a little bit like a burrito when she's in the, her Santa suit. Given that some stuff is read-only and some stuff is read-write, uh, if you recall our, our diagram, there are some options, right? You can uh, put everything in, in tightly coupled memory. Super fast is right next to the CPU, but it's a, it's a constrained resource. We only have 384. and because it, it takes a lot of uh, silicon you know, kind of uh, square footage, um, SOCs tend to have a limited amount of this. MRAM, which is a magneto resistive, oh man, I can never say that word, magneto resistive uh, RAM. And I come from uh, storage, that was where my, my career started. So I should be able to do any magneto anything. Uh, so. That's just me uh, not being able to say long words. Uh, so that is a kind of non-volatile RAM that we use in, in our chip. And then shared SRAM, is we, in our design, we place it a little further away from the chip. It's meant to be a kind of a shared RAM between our display controllers, uh, off-board uh, peripherals, and so on. Uh, but it's also accessible to AI. So I, I decided to measure that as well. And uh, for every combination that was uh, practical, I measured latency and energy. And I used a, a MLPERS keyword spotting benchmark, mostly because MLPERS has a really uh, nifty way of measuring energy and accuracy and latency. And, you know, engineers are lazy. I'll, I'll just reuse that. And then I tried every combination. Like uh, I stored the weights, that, that static part in TCM. Activations, uh, activations in TCM. And then, for example, here I turned off everything that was not uh, needed. So I turned off the external SRAM. In reality, you'll probably leave some of that on. Um, in practical terms, all that does is shift the graph that you're going to see in a minute. Uh, it doesn't actually shift the relative uh, positions of the dots in the graph. And here, here's the results. Um, 
And I had to run it a couple of times because NRAM and TCM are practically indistinguishable in terms of performance. Uh, I had to zoom in quite a bit here so you can see it. And some of the, you know, this is statistical kind of behavior. So sometimes NRAM would be a little faster than, than TCM. Um, but it's just, it's almost, it's like a miracle, uh, uh, NVM, like no, no penalty to using it. Uh, and we have uh, two megabytes of it. Now that doesn't mean we're not going to fight the, the watch face guys over some of that MRAM, but, uh, it means that, you know, we can probably count on 200 or 300 K of, of RAM, uh, of MRAM. Um, if you, if you do fit in TCM, go ahead uh, for, you know, benchmarks and so on. That's good. Okay. And I, and I, the, the, by the way, the, I should explain this graph when I say S, uh, like MRAM slash TCM means MRAM was storing the weights slash, uh, TCM was storing the activations. So my conclusion from this experiment is, of course, it's good to have options. If you look closely, um, the difference between SRAM and yeah, SRAM was definitely a little slower, but it's not inordinately slower. It's definitely still usable. Um, and it uses a little bit more power, but only marginally. So if you are running a lot of models, they have to swap in and out. SRAM or TCM are good options. Um, if, uh, you are fighting the watch face folks over MRAM, it's okay to, to kind of swap MRAM in from SRAM, for example, and get it a little faster. You have a lot of options here. Um, personally, uh, when I'm writing my uh, AI reference uh, designs, I'll use MRAM first and then TCM. Um, and the, the good news is that the SDK that we bundle with our parts makes all of this easy. So one or two lines of code um, uh, will switch every all the ar uh, architecture around. And that extends to also, like, remember I was turning off and on all the RAMs and stuff? Uh, that applies to that too. It's actually uh, trivial to do. And, and just taking a look at my, my example code, uh, we'll walk you through it. Yeah, I can't, I can't uh, conclude this without bragging a little bit. 5 to 16x performance improvement in terms of power utilization. It's not easy. So, um, this is how, how we do it. Like, uh, when you, uh, take a, a, a electronics class, they will teach you that a transistor is kind of a gate, right? It turns on, it turns off. And depending on the input voltage of, of that switching, that's where you turn on and off. It looks like a digital thing, but in reality, it's an analog circuit. And so, you, those thresholds that you pick for on and off are big enough that there's, you re reduce the error rate in the switching. And, and so you can reduce it, but now your transistor isn't as predictable. And so what Ambic has done is, uh, figure that out in a, in a way that you can actually productize. You can produce it to the tune of over a million, uh, parts a week at this point, right? Um, so it's, you know, at, as a, in, a Silicon Valley veteran, I've run into sub-threshold uh, startups many times. Uh, I've worked on sub-threshold uh, at Intel, for example, and I know how difficult it is. So when I first saw this slide, um, I was skeptical. And this is before I, I joined the company. And then I took the, the part and I ran MLPerf and... I was no longer skeptical. This thing is real. Um, and it really enables uh, an amazing array of, of solutions. It's not enough to just like uh, rest on your power laurels. You have to expose this in a user-friendly way. So we have a, a number of solutions uh, that are vary from reference code to SDKs. Um, for example, my, my uh, wheelhouse is the, the one on the far right, NeuralSpot. It basically makes using all that stuff, all that NRAM stuff, all the uh, peripherals, makes it easy for AI to use. Um, it's all built on our, our broad uh, Ambic Suite SDK. Um, and that's all built on our optimized peripherals and compute. I, I, I can briefly talk about how hard this is. 
And like if, if you've been in the industry for a while, you know that it's fairly easy to get a demonstration working in a lab, temperature controlled, voltage controlled. Um, the hard thing is getting it to work at every corner of your design, work, making it work from one corner of the wafer to another, uh, one wafer to another, um, and making it work on a watch. Because sometimes you're fully charged and sometimes your your battery is kind of running out and you don't want behavior to change. Same thing. You're going for a run, you you don't want your your watch to stop working. So this is the hard part. This is was this is a Ambix uh, secret sauce. Um, and we figured it out to the tune of a million chips a week plus. So now you have all this infinite, not infinite, boundless. It feels like boundless uh, power at your hands. Uh, you can either use it to make your battery life longer, or you can just pack more features in. Um, you can do sophisticated graphics. You can start adding nat natural language uh, interfaces. You can do more sophisticated algorithms like ECG without worrying about, oh, I just ran the ECG model. I used up a 10% of my battery. And then uh, you can actually do all that while putting on a pretty face with 3D graphics. Okay. And that's it. Um, thank you for your attention. And I hope to see you soon in another talk. Thanks.